Greetings again today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. God's given us an auspicious day in which to worship, and we appreciate that. And we appreciate your presence. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now, this is Preacher Edwards speaking. We're hoping during this hour coming up can be a real inspiration to you. And so if you have your Bible, I want you to turn to the book of Joshua, chapter 2, page 260 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. Now, write in and get some of our cassette tape. We'd be glad to send you a list. We have more than 200 listed. I'd be glad to send it to you in appreciation for a gift of $3 to help defray our radio expense. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. I'd like to hear from you. I have here in, in my hand one of our, our brochures pertaining to a proposed Holy Land tour for March of 1987. We're now getting things lined up, squared away for that tour. We do believe that everything will be settled somewhat by that time over there. We hope so. You notice I haven't been in a hijacking since our president dropped a few eggs over there on Libya. And maybe he's taught somebody a lesson. Of course, you'll never know when another might happen, but everything seems to be pretty calm at the present time, and I hope you'll continue to remain that way. And we're planning to fly the safest airlines in existence today, the Israelis and the Swiss airlines. We plan to go to Israel, and then after we leave Israel, we're going into Switzerland, going to Geneva, and I'm looking forward to going there. I've never been there out of all of my 12 trips to the Holy Land. And it's a trip, a wonderful trip indeed. I wish some of you members here of this church would plan to go. Now's the time to get your name on the list. You have from now until March to get things ready. Your full amount of your, your uh, expense won't be due until after the first of the year. You only place a down payment, get your name on the list. If something should happen that you can't go, you can get your down payment back, uh, provided you don't wait right to the last minute. And so think about it and pray about it. You and the radio listening audience, if you write in and request a brochure, I'll send you one by mail. And some of you may be out of church today and your pastor and his wife's never been. You ought to try to send your pastor and his wife to the Holy Land. No greater thing could you do for them than to send them to the Holy Land on these tours. I hope you have your Bible open at Joshua chapter 2. Some time ago I was uh, reading about this man in the choir. He couldn't hardly carry a tune. He threw whole sections off when he tried to sing and the choir members became somewhat irritable about it. And they said to the pastor, they said, well, something's got to be done, brother so-and-so. He throws the whole choir off many times and he really can't sing. We got to get him out of the choir. And the pastor said, let me handle it. They said, fine. The pastor went to him. He said, now listen, dear brother, I want to give you a little promotion. I want to appoint you as chairman of our usher board and let you take care of that. He said, no, thank you, pastor. I think I'll just stay in the choir. I wouldn't care for the change. I believe I'll just remain in the choir. The pastor said, well, I just got to level with you, dear brother. There's three or four people in that choir that tells me you just can't sing. Oh, he said, Pastor, don't worry about that. He said, I guess there's 30 or 40 people told me you couldn't preach, but I didn't let that bother me. <laughs> now, Joshua chapter 2, beginning with verse 1. And Joshua, the son of Nun, you notice that, said this man was the son of Nun. That's something, isn't it? I always thought you'd be the son of something, of somebody, but he said the son of Nun, didn't he? Joshua, the son of Nun, that was the man's name, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king of Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for they be come to search out all the country. And the woman took the two men and hid them, and said thus, 
that came in unto me, but I wist not whence they were. And it came to pass about the time of the shutting the gate, when it was dark, and the men went out. Where the men went, I went not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. And she had brought She said unto the men, I know not that the Lord has given you the land, and that your terror is falling upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you, when you came out of Egypt, and what you did under the two kings, the Amorites, that on the other side of Jordan, Sion Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Now that's as far as I'm reading. I want you to finish reading this chapter sometime today. You find here the story of Rahab the harlot. And I'm speaking today on this subject, the deeds of Rahab the harlot. This will be tape number 233, the deeds of Rahab the harlot. Now we talked last Sunday about the walls of Jericho falling down. And after the walls fell down, of course they went in. The Israelites didn't conquer Jericho. But there's a dear woman living there in Jericho. And the Bible said she was a harlot. She is a notorious sinner. She was a harlot. And she was a cursed Canaanite. Doomed for destruction. And she was an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. So God already pronounced a curse upon these people as she lived among them. And she was one of them that had a curse upon her. Not only did she have a curse upon her, but she was an alien from the commonwealth of Israel. She had no part in the Israelites, among the Israelites or in their group or their covenant. She was completely left out because she was a Canaanite under a curse. Not only that, but in addition to these, she was a harlot. And the Bible calls her a harlot. Now she was a harlot until God saved her and she became a sanctified saint of God. Although that name followed her, she's mentioned as Rahab the harlot, although she had been saved, sanctified by the power of God Almighty and become a wonderful believer in the Lord and God had saved her from all of her sins. Now there's a few things I want to say about her, some of her deeds. I want us to notice the real ground of a faith. Now she had to have a ground for her faith. There had to be something that caused her to repent and believe and accept Jehovah as her God. There must be a ground for it. The Bible says in Romans chapter 10 and verse 17, So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. She had to hear something about God, about Jehovah, about these Israelites, for her to repent and believe. The Bible says here in Joshua chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. As she talked to these two spies that came to reckon order the land. It said she said unto the men. I know the Lord hath given you the land. And that your terror is falling unto us. And that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. Now notice this. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. When you came out of Egypt. And what you did under the two kings, the Amorites, that were on the other side of Jordan, Zion and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Now what she's saying here is that I heard, or we heard, about your God. We heard how the Lord had blessed you and given you victory. Now she took these things to heart. Faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Now those that believe not, of course, perished, but she believed and she did not perish. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 31, By faith the harlot Rahab perished not with them which believed not. Now she was in the midst of a group of people that had the curse of God on them, unbelievers, uh, men that had sinned against God and this iniquity was full, the cup was full, and God had designated them for destruction. And she lived among them, but she heard about Jehovah. She heard about God. She heard what the Lord had done through the Israelites. And she believed. Like the two thieves on the cross dying beside of Jesus. One said, if thou be the Son of God, come down and save yourself and us. And that big if sent him to hell because there was a doubt in his mind about it. The other said, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. So the believing makes a difference. If you're saved today, your believing made the difference. That's why you're here and why you're saved. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Secondly, 
I want you to notice the effect of her faith. Now, she had strong faith in God. Brother James made mention of it in the book of James, the brother of Jesus that wrote the book of James. James said in James 2, 25, Likewise also was not Rahab the harlot justified by works when she received the messages and sent them out another way. Now, what he's saying is she was justified by works in the eyes of the people, not in the eyes of God. You're justified by faith in the eyes of God for salvation, but you're justified in the eyes of people by what you do for God. They see your efforts and they say that person is a saved person because he's serving the Lord. I see the fruits of his efforts. I see his good works. The Bible says in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 6, For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision nor uncircumcision availeth anything, it tells us there, but faith which worketh by love is what accomplishes things. Faith that worketh by love, by the love of God. And so she believed in the Lord. She welcomed God's men into her house. Now she lived there on the city wall and she welcomed these two spies that came to reconnoiter the land. She welcomed them into her house. She said, I want you men to come in and make yourself at home. And when they came in, she engaged them in a spiritual conversation. Now she was a harlot. She did not invite them in for immoral reasons. She invited them in that she might talk to them about the things of God. She had heard about the things of God. And she had believed them. And she wanted to know more about them. So she engaged them in a conversation about the Lord. About their background. About their people. About what God had done through them. And she made provisions for their safety. She said... I know when the king of Jericho finds out these men are in my house, he'll put them to death. He don't know they're spies who came in to spout the land. He'll put them to death. And the Bible tells us she made provision for them. She said, I want you to come up on top of the roof. I have some flax up there and I will hide you behind the stalks of flax. And that she did. She made provision for the men of God. And she refused to betray them. She hid them from danger. And in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, the Bible says, Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, thereby some have entertained angels unaware. Now there she entertained these two men, these strangers, but she observed that they were Israelites, God's people, and she protected them and kept them from harm and danger and jeopardy of her own life and her own people. But she did that. Number three, let's notice somewhat the nature of this woman's faith, the deeds of the nature of a faith. It was a single faith she alone believed. You don't have any record where anybody else in the cursed city of Jericho believed in God but this woman only. She believed it was single faith and she believed in God. Not only that, it was a sanctifying faith. She was not a harlot any longer. Although in pointing her out in the Bible, the writers, the Holy Spirit, always call her Rahab the harlot so you know who they were talking about. But she was not a harlot any longer. Now when you get saved, I don't care what your background may have been, whether you're a drunkard, gambler, harlot, whoremonger, whatnot, you're not anymore when God saved you. Now in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 10, the Bible tells you there that search with some of you, but now you're sanctified and God sanctifies and saves you from your past sins. I don't care how far you've gone in the gutter. You may have been a drunkard, a gambler, a killer, or whatnot. But when you get saved, God saves you from those sins. And you're no longer a murderer. You're no longer a drunkard. You're no longer a harlot. You're no longer a gambler, a cursor, a thief, a robber. When God saves you, you become a saint of God in Christ Jesus. And God blots out all of your sins. There may be some of you out in the radio listening to us right now. You're nursing a headache. You stayed out last night drinking, carousing around, living like the devil and living it up. And you knew you were doing wrong. And today you have a terrible headache. And you're a drunkard. You got drunk last night. Well, God can save you and make a saint of God out of you. God can make a Christian out of you. God can pardon you from your sins and forgive you of all that cursing and stealing and lying and cheating and all those evils you have done. So God sanctified her, made a real believer out of her, 
And it was a self-denying faith. She put her God before the safety of her country. Now she knew, she knew that these men had come in to spire out a Jericho. And she put herself, denied herself, and exercised faith in God and put God before the safety of her own country. And she is willing to do that to the glory of God. Number four, notice the confession of her faith. You'll read that in Joshua chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. It said, And she said unto them, I know the Lord had given you the land, and that your terror is falling upon us, and that all in the heavens the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did unto the kings of the Amorites and on the other side of Jordan, Sion, and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And so she had faith in God and she confessed that faith. She said, I believe that. I believe you did that. I believe God did that for you. And she was exactly right. In Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, the Bible said, For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So she confessed. She confessed to these men what she believed, and she believed in their God. In Luke chapter 9 and verse 26, the Bible says, Whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10 and verse 33, But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will also deny before my Father which is in heaven. So here we find this woman standing up for God. She did not deny the Lord. She stood up for Jehovah God. She stood up for God's people and made a confession of faith. She believed. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth confession is made unto salvation. But the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21 verse 8. They're fearful and so forth. There go the lake of fire. But if you're willing to repent and believe and accept Christ as your savior. Heaven will be your ultimate destination. And you need to realize that. Now let's move on a little further. There's another great deed here that this uh, lady did. And that is the. Let's notice the real breadth of a faith, how it reached out and touched others. In Joshua chapter 2, verses 12 through 13, Now therefore I pray you, swear unto me by the Lord, since I have showed you kindness, that you will also show kindness unto my father's house, and give me a true token, and that ye shall save alive my father and my mother, my brethren and my sisters, and all that they have, and deliver our lives from death. Isn't that wonderful? Here's a girl that got saved. She had been a harlot and lived a terrible sinful life, no doubt. But now God has saved her. And since God had saved her, she became concerned about her mother, about her father, about her brothers, about her sisters, and all they had in their family. She said to these two men, would you promise me, would you give me a true token, if I will protect you and keep you from being killed by the king of this, this city, if I will protect you and help you, would you promise to do something for me? Would you give me a true token? Would you promise not only when you save me alive, that you save my mother, and that you save my father, and that you save my brothers and my sisters? Would you do that? Would you give me a true token of what they have in their family? Would you spare them? And they said, we most certainly will do that, Rahab. We'll promise you that. We'll certainly do that. Now, it is right that we should desire God to show mercy on our people. Now, Paul said, I could have a curse on me if that would save Israel. I'd be willing to be cursed from Christ if that would save Israel. Now, if you're not concerned about your lost loved ones, there's something wrong somewhere you either backslidden on god or you've never been saved every saved person ought to be concerned about their lost loved ones while well, when god first saved me that's the first group i started working on some of my relatives some of them sitting right here tonight saved back in those early days because of our, our efforts in trying to get them and people to god i was concerned about it I have some of my precious loved ones in heaven today because of special effort I put forth in the early days of my uh, uh, ministry when I was only a, a saved person, not even a preacher, and I had the privilege to win to God. 
I drove all the way from Greenville, South Carolina, to witness to my sister-in-law who had given birth to a child. She's only about 16 years old. And she gave birth to a child and, and the, something happened there. Something went wrong and she became seriously ill. And God said for me to come from Greenville over to witness to her. God's laid that on my heart. And I got off of my job. And getting off of your job in those days when you're only making about 14 or $15 a week and lose a day's work. Whenever you, if you uh, fell short a dollar, then you certainly went in the hole uh, financially. But I got off of my job and drove from Greenville to where she was abiding in my parents' home. And I came in and she was lying on the bed. And I went in the bedroom and I got on my knees. And I called her by name. I said, I am. Wouldn't you like to give your heart to Jesus? Wouldn't you like to get saved? And she said, Virgil, I sure would. Said, I'd like to get saved. Said, I'm, I'm sick. I said, the Lord wants to save you. And I've come all the way from Greenville over here to lead you to Jesus. And she said she was glad. And there I led that beautiful young girl to Jesus. And there she was gloriously saved. She died, I believe, the next day. They brought her body back to Greenville and they had buried her. She had given birth to a little boy, a little son, and when he was exactly two years old, on his birthday, he went to join his mother all of a sudden. But God Almighty laid it on my heart to come and reach her. And I had a, what if I had not done that? That poor girl would probably died and gone to hell and been in hell today. You need to be concerned about your loved ones. If you don't try to win them for God, you couldn't blame anybody else for not trying. You should try to win them first to God. That's what she did. She said, I want my mother. I want my daddy. I want my brothers. I want my sisters. I want them saved too. And they said, they'll be spared. They'll be spared. And then number seven, the reward of a faith. She perished not with them to believe not. Now when the Israelites came in, there they perished. That is the, the people in Jericho, the Jerichoites perished. When the Israelites came in, all except her and her loved ones that she had brought under her roof. Her house is on the town's wall. In Joshua chapter 2 and verse 15, for her house is upon the town wall. And the Bible said in Hebrews 11, 30, by faith the walls of Jericho fell down. Now I don't know what happened. Evidently all the wall fell except just that part where she lived. See, they built walls around the cities in those days. And on the inside of the city, they put their homes, many of them in the city walls. And they lived in the city walls. And part of the home made part of the wall. And she lived in the city wall. And the walls fell down, but God spared her and her family in her little home there on the wall. God took care of her. And she perished not with them that believed not. God's people were spared. And now when God saved her, whenever the Israelites came in and captured Jericho, she was spared, her people were spared, and they were carried back, introduced to Joshua, and accepted in the camp of Israel. And became part of the Israelites, part of God's people. She dwelt in that camp. In Joshua chapter 6 and verse 25, And Joshua saved Rahab the heart alive, and her father's household, all that she had. And she dwelt in Israel even unto this day, because she hid the messages which Joshua sent to spy out the land. He just took her and all the loved ones in, and they became part of them, and fed them and cared for them, and loved them, because she had uh, protected the spies that came in. She was given a place in the congregation of the Lord. She's not a slave of Satan any longer. She was not a cursed person any longer. She was in the congregation of the house of the Lord. And that's exactly what God did for you. You out here, a Gentile dog under a curse. God saved you and put you in Christ and gave you a place in the family of God and the household of God. That's exactly what God did for you. That's what God did for me. She was greatly honored. Now notice what happened to her. Whenever they captured Jericho and brought her into the, the household of Israel, she became the honored wife of a prince in Judah. That's a young prince, handsome young man in Judah, and she married him. And then she became the mother of Boaz. Rahab became the mother of Boaz, and Boaz became the husband of Ruth, don't you remember, in the book of Ruth. 
She became the mother of Boaz, one of the grandmothers of David. She was a grandmother. She became the saved harlot and had a curse on her, became the grandmother of David. Her name is recorded in Matthew chapter 1 among the ancestors of the Savior. She became one of the mothers of Jesus, if you please. See what the grace of God can do for a person? Reach down and lift them up out of the depths of sin. Make something out of them. Put them in the family of God. Forgive them of all their sins. And make them a saint of God in Christ Jesus. I don't care how far you've gone in sin. God can do that for you. Many years ago, there's a fallen woman. No one had anything to do with her. She was a harlot, very filthy, mean, ungodly. And no one would associate with her. But there was a young Christian woman who had been saved and loved sinners and Love those fallen women who wanted to help them. And wanted to talk to this woman. Knew not how to approach it. One day they brought this fallen woman out of jail. And they, the policemen were leading her down the street. For, to be tried and sent to prison. And she was cursing and fighting. And doing all she could to get away from the officers. And cursing them to their face. And then this mission worker. This dear woman. Said oh God I need to help that woman. Lord what can I do? And the Spirit of God said to her, go and kiss her on her cheek. And she ran over, she put her arms around her, and she kissed her on her cheek. And the very moment she kissed her, she ceased her cursing and fighting. and became as calm as a little lamb. They tried her and sent her to prison. And the next day, this a missionary was going through the prison cells, walking down the corridor. She heard somebody, heard a woman in the cell saying, who kissed me? Somebody kissed me. Who kissed me? Somebody kissed me. She stopped and the missionary recognized the woman to be the one she'd kissed out on the street the day before. And she began to talk to her and she said, why do you ask the question who kissed you? She said, you know, somebody kissed me yesterday that reminded me something. Said my mother on her deathbed put her arms around my neck and she kissed me on my cheek. And she said, daughter, would you promise mama that you'd meet me in heaven someday? And she said, I promised my mother that I'd meet her in heaven someday. And she kissed me on the cheek just before she died. And she said, you know, nobody's ever kissed me with a love like that and affection until somebody kissed me yesterday. And that felt like the kiss of my mother. And that reminded me of what I promised my precious mother. And I want to get saved. And I want to meet my mother in heaven. And this missionary, this young lady, knelt with her and led her to Jesus Christ. And she become a mighty worker for God until God called her home. Oh, because she was willing to kiss that fallen woman on the street that day and show a little love and affection. Are you saved today? If not, you ought to give your heart to Jesus. Let's stand to our feet for a word of prayer. Our Father, I pray now that you'll use the message that you speak to hearts. That somebody out in the radio listen ought to be saved today. Yea, somebody will be touched here in this auditorium. We thank you for the marvelous grace of God. And we thank you even for the story of the testimony of Rahab the harlot that had been saved by the grace of God. Thank you for it. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Debbie's going to play for us. Now listen to me closely. If you're in this building unsaved, you ought to get out here and get saved. You, it's appointed to men once to die and after that the judgment. You know, when God may call, if you had a fellowship with the Lord, you ought to come down and get back into fellowship with God. If you don't have a church home and you like Northside and you choose this church to be your church home, would you like to come down and unite with this church where we receive members? Or any other reason I haven't mentioned you feel you ought to come, would you come? Paul Debbie plays, would you come? Come on, if God is speaking. like to transfer your church membership to this church from some other? Or would you like to join the church so as a candidate for baptism? Or would you like to be saved while we wait? Would you come? We'll give you ample time to respond. Would you come?
message, God, laid on my heart. Now the responsibility rests on you.